Thank you for coming. Uh, my name is Romain Robert. I'm working for the EDPS. Um, I'm happy to welcome you here at the EDPS with this um, privacy lunch call organized um, uh, with the uh, privacy hub of the BUP, the University of Brussels, and EDPS. Uh, it's one of the rare, rare times that we organize this kind of event uh, together here at EDPS, I think. Yes. I hope we will have a, a very interesting discussion. Um, I will give the floor to Gloria. We will, uh, we will be moderating the panel today. Uh, Gloria is, uh, is you, if you don't know, Gloria is a um, uh, research professor at uh, VUB as well. Um, we will discuss the theme that you have already discovered in the uh, description of the discussion of today. Um, I will just give you two more details. The first thing is that the panel will be filmed. And I think, as far as I understand, the audience will not be filmed. If you just see uh, the camera just uh, aiming at you, just uh, make a sign, because it's a data protection, uh, data protection event, and we don't, we don't want you to be uh, filmed if you don't want to. Uh, second thing, we might have some noise, because just to explain you why you see so many works uh, all around, is because this very meeting room will soon be the, uh, one of the official meeting rooms of the future European Data Protection Board. So we are living an historical moment here. We are <laughs> sitting in a meeting room where uh, a lot of decisions will uh, take place as of uh, May, June. It depends on where the works will be um, finalized. Um, and the last thing, I just wanted to trigger the discussion uh, on the tweet that I read from uh, Isabel Falpierotin yesterday, you know, the ex-chair of the uh, Article 29 Working Party. Uh, stating on the Twitter that uh, she cannot understand that you can sell your data uh, and que les données ne sont pas des petits pois. So I guess we can uh, start from this line. <laughs> That's an interesting uh, triggering line. To give the floor to Gloria, we will um, introduce the panelists, I think, yes. and moderate the panel. Thank you very much. So thank you, thank you very much, Romain. It's actually the, the first uh, time that we have a lunchtime event co-organized by the EDPS and by the Brussels Privacy Hub. So from the, on behalf of the Brussels Privacy Hub, thank you, EDPS, for welcoming us. We're very happy to be here. And actually, it's not the, the first time we have a, um, an event on this subject in a wide sense. So I think that actually we have for today a number of subjects under this question of the values of data. We have the, the, the question of what are the values of personal data, the values of privacy, but also this question of commodification of data. And actually, I was here in September or October in this room talking about data ownership. And, and we had then other events. And I have the feeling that there's a sort of evolution in our discussions that at the beginning we were uh, wondering uh, how can this ever be a good idea to, to sell, uh, to exchange your, your data for something. Then we, we have the discussion of actually uh, People think it's a good idea, so why could it, this be a good idea? And now we are moving to this uh, phase where actually it's probably going to happen. I don't know if it's going to happen. So the question is, how badly implemented is this going to, to be? So that's my, my main concern. But I think actually, yes, there are, there are many issues that we could discuss, and I hope you have many, many questions for the speakers, because we have four brilliant speakers. And I will indeed introduce them. They will have each five, seven minutes to, to talk, and then we will have the, the discussion with you and, and with your questions. So this is a, a subject that is actually a bit difficult for us as data protection experts because it's not only about the GDPR. We normally read the GDPR. When we go to the end of the GDPR, we go back to the beginning <laughs> and then we're just doing this. But actually, it requires that you read all the stuff. And luckily, we have here one of the rare data protection experts that uh, is a, capable of moving out sometimes from the GDPR, he's trying. <laughs> and actually he knows almost everything about all the other instruments that are beyond the, the GDPR. So it's Damian Clifford, he's uh, with CTIP at uh, K11. And he, he knows many, many, many things about yes, the relation between data protection law and consumer law. And he promised that today, so we can have a, a nice discussion, he will tell us everything he knows and we will get his knowledge, but in five minutes. So now he has five minutes to bring us to his state of knowledge. Please be, be ready, be, be focused, listen to him, and yes, good luck. <laughs> I think good luck is probably a good way to start this. Um, yeah, so I think um, what I'll do is I'll speak generally about the Digital Content Directive and how it relates to the GDPR, but also a little bit to the Unfair Terms Directive. Um, and I'll just raise maybe three points. So the first one will uh, deal with the active passive uh, provision of data that's provided for in the uh, Commission and but also the Council draft 
Uh, then I'll speak a little bit about contra contract formation and consideration or counterperformance. Uh, and then a little bit towards the end, I'll just mention some of the unfair terms uh, discussion uh, that's in uh, Recital 42. Uh, now, there's a couple of the provisions that are kind of juxtaposed there just to make it a little bit easier so you can see what I'm, what I'm talking about. Uh, I've only stuck to the what would be the binding provisions. Um, <clears throat> so as I mentioned, the Commission and the Council draft draw a distinction between passive and active personal data provision. Um, and this, I suppose, uh, it raises uh, key problems from a privacy and data protection issue uh, perspective. Uh, because uh, this passive uh, provision includes uh, cookies and IP addresses. Now, for those of you aware, uh, or from a, a more of a privacy and data protection background, uh, that raises key challenges from the e-privacy uh, directive perspective, so the Article 5.3 there, uh, which uh, deals with uh, cookies or cookie-like technologies and requires consent. But uh, in relation to IP addresses, you also have uh, several decisions declaring IP addresses to be personal data. Uh, and I think the most recent one would be the Breyer case, uh, which related to dynamic IPs. Um, so um, now, although IP addresses might be, and the processing of them might be legitimized under other bases, as provided in Article 6.1 of the GDPR, so legitimate interests or contract, etc. Uh, the digital content proposal uh, essentially tries to exclude uh, uh, other conditions for processing. So essentially it's consent that activates the, the operation of the directive. Uh, and you can refer to Article 3.4 of the Commission and the Parliament drafts and in the extended um, Article 3.1 of the Council version. Uh, therefore, consent is required. Um, but uh, the proposed directive, for some reason, creates this subcategorization uh, of personal data sets that isn't uh, actually in privacy and data protection law. Uh, and from a data protection perspective, this makes no sense. So, Nina, if you change the slide there just for a second. Um, and that's uh, irrespective of the fact that the directive in all versions says that there is to be no uh, problem between the alignment of the GDPR, e-privacy, etc. So uh, it's irrespective of that, it seems to do it inherently in its very design. Um, so if you could change the slide again, <laughs> thanks. Um, so just back to the original one. So um, now just moving on to the contract formation uh, and consideration or counterperformance issue. Um, so why are they doing this? Why are they recognizing uh, personal data as counterperformance uh, in uh, B2C contracts. So uh, in my own opinion, having looked at this for a little bit now, it would be that uh, it relates to the failure to harmonize contract formation at the EU level. So you can see um, the failure of the optional instrument, um, essentially with you know, this directive, it was a, a regulation actually trying to provide optional instrument for the formation of contracts at the EU level that would act in addition to national consumer or contract formation laws. Uh, so out of the failure of that, and you can also look at the, the history of the Consumer Rights Directive and the jettisoning of large parts of that. Um, so out of that, out of those failures, now we have basically the Commission is a little bit hesitant uh, in approaching contract formation, harmonization, and instead they're trying to get um, uh, go towards um, more recognizing that counterperformance or personal data as counterperformance, that it can be consideration. So instead of focusing on harmonizing the rules around contract formation, they're trying to recognize personal data as, as consideration. Um, so, um, um, and I, I suppose the point I want to make here is this ties back a little bit to the passive and active distinction. Um, um, so, uh, um, because I suppose if you take this from a common law perspective, uh, we are very much rooted in uh, this notion of consideration. Uh, so, I mean, I, I'm Irish, so that's why I'm saying we. Um, so we need this value exchange. Um, uh, and this still seems to be a, an issue in terms of harmonization at the EU level. Uh, and we can see this also in the various versions that we have here, because if you look at the council version, for instance, it's constructed in negative terms. Um, so even though it uh, deletes the specific reference to counterperformance, it's both all versions either implicitly or explicitly recognize that uh, personal data will be counterperformance, but the council uh, version 
uh, approaches in negative terms by saying that it shall not apply uh, rather than it shall apply. Yeah? So it's still afraid of this contract formation uh, harmonization uh, issue. Um, and I, I suppose uh, moving on then a little bit just to relate this to data protection, we can go on to the next slide. Um, we can say that this arguably blur blurs the lines between Article 6.1a, uh, which is consent, uh, and Article 6.1b, contract, uh, as uh, basically a uh, contract will be excluded, but consent will be required to form the consumer contract. So essentially, con consent now is forming a B2C consumer contract. Uh, and we must also, I mean, you can see somewhat of a distinction there uh, a little bit because it's if we look in particular, I suppose, uh, to the definition of consent, we can see that uh, in, in the stipulations, I'm, what I'm referring to specifically would be the freely given stipulation and how that is affected. Uh, so if we move on to the next slide again. Um, so uh, what's important here when we're interpreting the freely given stipulation, we can refer to Article 7.4. Um, which essentially says that uh, uh, processing not necessary for the performance of the contract, um, it's, it's creating a separate uh, a, a distinction. So um, you basically can't render consent conditional uh, for, the, uh, for the provision of the contract or utmost account will be given. Now the wording in, in Recital 43 is a lot stronger than it is in Article 7.4. So there seems to be a little bit of uncertainty as to what will that actually will mean. Um, and uh, in a recent uh, working paper that I've just put up this morning, actually, with two colleagues, so it's uh, with Peggy Valka and Inga Graf, uh, we're arguing potentially there might be a role for competition law here in uh, assessing this imbalance. Um, so uh, the final bit that I just want to mention then is, um, is, is this limited, actually, to this proposal? Are there broader concerns, even within the terms of the GDPR itself? And what I'm referring to here is this recital 42, which makes a cross-reference to uh, the uh, unfair terms directive. So the unfair terms directive applies B to C between businesses and consumers, uh, and essentially regulates the fairness of contractual terms. Uh, what's interesting is that this uh, particular recital refers to pre-formulated declarations of consent. So uh, my question, I suppose, and um, what I'm trying to do is provoke a little bit um, a discussion about is what is the relationship between pre-formulated declarations of consent and terms and conditions and privacy policies. Um, what is interesting about the unfair terms directive is that there's two levels of fairness there in, in provided. There's a substantive fairness test and there's a, um, a formal fairness test. So the formal fairness test applies across the board, whereas the substantive fairness test at the EU level, because it's a minimum harmonization directive, applies, uh, doesn't apply to the core terms. So if personal data uh, are deemed consideration, then they will be deemed a core term, and then the substantive fairness test won't apply. Um, so it's, it's, you know, how, what are the core terms, uh, what is the GDPR trying to reference here, uh, how are they positioning it? Now, in my own opinion, uh, they're not saying that the pre-formulated declaration of consent is a contract in itself, they're saying that it's the pre-formulated declaration of consent must be viewed with the terms and conditions, must be viewed with the privacy policy, and then altogether they're a contract. But it still leaves the issue of what is the counter-performance, what is the consideration, uh, vague and uncertain. Uh, and essentially, it just mirrors the fact that this isn't harmonized at the EU level. So um, essentially, I think all of this uh, comes down, uh, I think my conclusion, I suppose, is is, a con is it a conclusion or is there just a, a large degree of confusion about everything? Um, and I think, that, uh, I think that that's definitely the case. I, I think that there are uh, key issues in terming in the determination of how the unfair terms directive is going to, uh, how it's being viewed through the GDPR. Um, and uh, also, I think that uh, there will need to be a, a, a large discussion around what is meant by freely given consent mm -hmm. in terms of Article 7.4. Uh, and I also uh, think that it's worth pointing to the e privacy, uh, ongoing e privacy. Uh, 
negotiations here in the proposed regulation because there is uh, obviously a discussion about cookie walls. So if you allow co uh, the cookie walls to, ha to exist essentially, what you're saying is that uh, it, it can be conditional. Consent can be conditional, or the provision of the service can be conditional upon consent. Um, so I think I'll leave it there. I'm not sure how I did in time, but uh, <laughs> it's complex issues. <laughs> Thank you very much. It was quite technical. So actually, you're allowed. You have, you have a technical question, a specific question about what was explained because it was quite specific. Otherwise, just think about it, and we will continue with the with the presentations. But I think we were already thrown into the complexities of the of the interconnections between between legal frameworks. Now we are moving to another issue, dimension, another issue. You mentioned somewhere the, the business, and, and so the business is a part of this discussion. If personal data have value, and we think about the value of data, it's also because they have value for uh, business. So we have now a speaker who's going to tackle the, the discussion from this perspective is Geraldine Proust from FEDMA, which is the Federation of European Direct and Interactive Marketing. And she is EU legal officers of Legal Affairs Manager. So, Geraldine, please, you have the floor. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much for, for the invitation uh, here today. We're very happy to be part of, uh, of, this, uh, of this discussion. Um, so, when, when, we, when we started um, talking about this, uh, this topic, we had uh, three questions which, uh, which came to mind. The, the first one was, um, if a clearer perception of the values of data uh, could reinforce the protection of, of individuals. And um, uh, the, the, the other question was, can, is the progressive tendency of commodification or uh, exchanging of uh, data, um, uh, is that uh, potentially going against fundamental rights? And um, also we, we asked ourselves the question of how to approach uh, data as an asset. And so, um, well, um, these, these are three very interesting questions, three, three questions uh, w which are difficult to answer in a nutshell, but I will try to answer them uh, in, a, in a nutshell. Um, yes, better perception by the consumer of the value exchange can reinforce data protection of the individual. Uh, in the sense that um, the better the, the, the consumer understands um, the, the purpose and the consequences of um, the data processing, the better uh, he, she will understand uh, the value exchange. And um, this, uh, this, is, um, this gives, the this gives uh, for the organization a better chance to meet um, legitimate interest and uh, to meet uh, the expectations of, uh, of the consumer. And it also uh, helps the consumer have more uh, trust and confidence in the organization. So it creates, um, um, it cr it creates um, a win-win situation both uh, for, the, for the consumer and for the trader. Um, and so uh, recently, um, you, the UK Direct Marketing Association and Axiom um, commissioned uh, a study on, on privacy and, and uh, what the consumer really thinks. And um, this is the third time that they uh, commission uh, such, such a study. And um, we, we, can, we can see in the study that um, it is really important uh, to ensure that the benefits, the potential benefits of the data exchange are communicated clearly to, to consumers and um, that consumers have a growing interest in a range of incentives uh, beyond uh, direct monetary reward. And, um, and so um, some of the, some of the, the values um, that consumers see in, in data, some of the incentives that they're, they're looking for is, for example, um, loyalty points, uh, discounted products, access to exclusive events, um, uh, and and um, direct financial reward. So um, we see that the relationship of the consumer with data is evolving, maturing, and it's actually making us optimistic that we're heading towards uh, a, a win-win situation um, for both organizations and, um, and, uh, and consumers. So 63% um, uh, well, sorry, um, we, today about 50% of respondents said that they were data pragmatists, so they were willing uh, 
to make trade-offs on a case-by-case -case basis of, um, of their data. So um, yes, to, 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 to the first question, we think that um, a better perception of the value of data can help um, uh, pu pu push forward data uh, protection and help the consumer make, make a, a choice. Uh, also, my market diversity will help the consumer uh, to, be, uh, to have a better sense of uh, the value of, uh, of their data. Um, as for the question of uh, if um, the progressive tendency of um, exchanging value, uh, exchanging data for um, uh, discount services, uh, better service, innovation, etc., if, if that is um, uh, going, um, creating a risk uh, regarding European fundamental rights, we would say that um, the GDPR, this is part of the risk-based approach which, which is in the GDPR and that if a, the, the right balance is, is struck and uh, that uh, appropriate safeguards are put into place, um, this uh, should, should be possible and should be okay. Um, so the GDPR does provide four tools to ensure that data processing is fair. And, um, and so, um, Therefore, the question is how the industry can better demonstrate and communicate the value of this exchange to, uh, to the consumer. And for controllers, the question uh, is really about uh, making sure that our processing is fair and communicating, demonstrating this better and the value of exchange better to the consumer. So it does mean uh, working on uh, transparency. And um, as I said, it also means using appropriate safeguards um, under the GDPR. Accountability is a key principle uh, under the GDPR and it does provide for the controller to be able to demonstrate uh, compliance to the principles of the, of the GDPR. Um, so what next? How to, how to approach data um, as, a, as an asset? Well, we would say, uh, in a nutshell, in a, in a balanced uh, approach. So we, we need to respect the risk-based approach that was taken in the GDPR. Um, and uh, we need to allow for certain flexibility and for market diversity to, um, to, to develop. And we need to sustain this balance uh, that was reached in the GDPR in discussions uh, like um, on, on discussion of, of consent um, also, when we're talking of other legislations, just like the Digital Content Directive, which, which we mentioned uh, now, and also the e-privacy. And so, uh, at this stage, we, 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 we do fear that there is a lot of, um, there's a risk of muddling the general data protection regulation without actually giving it a proper chance. So um, we'd like to, to, to have the GDPR have, have the chance to be uh, properly implemented um, um, before uh, further legislation comes or before creating risks of uh, overlaps and contradictions. Um, and, um, and so these, these are the points that I'd like to, to put forward at this, uh, this stage. Thank you very much. Is there a specific question here? No, we can just keep on thinking about the general questions. That's uh, very interesting. I thought it was interesting that the, when we give the floor to the business side, they tell us what the consumer really thinks. So perhaps <laughs> now we will discover what the businesses really think, because we move to the representative of the European Consumer Organization, Agustin Reina. He's actually uh, responsible at Berg, or, or, um, responsible of competition law uh, issues. So there was a mention of competition law, perhaps he can say something more, but actually in his free time he writes academic papers on consumer uh, law and data protection law, so it's very, very convenient. Uh, Agustin, you have yeah. the floor. Thank you, thank you very much also to the DPS colleagues for the invitation and for putting together this very interesting and provocative uh, panel discussion. Um, I would like to start with uh, something that my both co-panelists have mentioned, the idea of value data as an asset and the need for a value exchange. And this put forward basically two questions. First, can we trade with personal data? And if so, should we trade with personal data? I will focus mainly on the first question and, and hopefully in the, um, uh, in the discussions we can uh, consider the ethical aspects of this exchange. And this is a recurrent topic in data protection uh, debate which requires some conceptual considerations. First of all, when we talk 
about trading, selling, or even licensing something, we're always assuming that we own that thing that we try to sell, to trade, or to license. This applies, for example, to a car, to a piece of art, or even to intangible assets like software or energy. So the idea of ownership that we have over a thing is recognized by the law. Or to put it differently, I own something because the law says so. So for example, in many civil law uh, tradition, if I am in possession of, uh, in bona fide of a mobile item, the law presumes that it belongs to me. Therefore, I can trade it, sell it, or license it. There is no such legal treatment when it comes to data, including personal data. Even if the term personal, impersonal data, evokes the idea of ownership, there is, not corresponding, there is no corresponding legal recognition for such a status. That means, legally speaking, your data does not belong to you or to anyone. What the data or the, the law provides are unwaverable rights to access, rectify, delete, or port any data that refers to you within the conditions of the uh, GDPR. This is a very important debate uh, element for our debate because it is in the digital content directive, as mentioned before, the first time that we are seeing this uh, data uh, consider as a, as a counter performance, as an element of exchange. So there is an indirect recognition of a kind of ownership, proprietary right over the data. The initial commission proposal was extended to personal data and any other data, so data in a broad sense, but then the European Parliament and the Council decided to narrow it down to uh, uh, personal data. But what is important is that this idea of a counter-performance is alien to data protection law. Uh, it reflects the um, Roman principle, do this. So I do something, I give something in order to obtain something in exchange. And rightly so, this has uh, brought some debate in the um, privacy uh, community because um, some have argued, for example, that the treatment of data as a counter-performer equals to the commodification of uh, personal data and therefore risk creating conflicts with the uh, rights, for example, of the GDPR. And I think when it comes to the Commission's proposal on the digital content uh, directive, that was the case. So the use of the term counter-performance was not the most appropriate uh, term or institution introduced in this uh, context. First of all, because counter-performance denotes the idea of an exchange of a tangible good or a service that one party offers to the other in exchange of uh, something else, which in the case of data uh, is not neither a service nor a, a good. For us, although that we do see another value of extending the protection afforded by contract law to this type of situations, the idea of um, remuneration seems to be more appropriate, for example, in line of what we have in the e-commerce directive and something that also was highlighted by the EDPS opinion on this um, proposal. However, this doesn't set aside all the concerns about the codification of personal data, but legally speaking, it's more appropriate um, with the idea of an exchange between uh, a service with the idea that the consumer pay um, the supply for providing that service in exchange of the data or upon the collection of the data, what was referred before as the passive uh, provision of the, uh, the data. But here we face a fundamental problem, which is that when you exchange something, you know about the value of the thing that you give in a way. So if I want to get this pen, I know that I will have to go and pay an X amount of money. If I want to exchange a car for another car, I know more or what is the value, and then you exchange it. When it comes to personal data, first of all, people are not aware of the value, and secondly, might not even be aware that they're giving this data or allowing the collection of this data in exchange of the service. So there is a fundamental problem that, unfortunately, contract law cannot solve itself. So then we have to think, or mainly the, the policymaker, have to consider how to solve this uh, knowledge gap you know, through 
for example, a kind of legal fiction in which we assume that the service that is provided is uh, as a result of the collection of personal data is the result of such an uh, exchange. Then we have the question where that situation will conflict, for example, with the, with the GDPR. It was mentioned in Article 7, Paragraph 4, which I think is a, is a very relevant um, provision, which has not been, was not been really taken into account at the moment of drafting the, um, the proposal, uh, and therefore some specific clarification uh, will be needed in the text. But if properly drafted, there shouldn't be a reason for a conflict between the uh, two instruments, but mainly as a way to complement uh, each other. And what are the reasons for that? First, in a cinematic contract of whatever nature, where it is a sales contract, service contract, against money, against account performance, or any other remuneration, to use um, the reference uh, to the uh, e-commerce directive, uh, the parties are always subject to the mandatory provision of the, le the legislation that cannot be deviated by contract. This is the case of the GDPR or data, data uh, protection law. Uh, we can even argue that the GDPR uh, would belong to the so-called European or public. No? Therefore, the parties in the contract will not be able to deviate from the, uh, the rights. Um, or, for example, to put it on the other way, the companies will not be able to impose conditions on consumers that are in conflict with the principle of the GDPR, arguing that the data will be needed because it's a, for a sort of counter-performance or exchange for the provision of the services. Secondly, the indirect assignment of a proprietary nature to personal data by means of a recognition of data as a counter-performer or any sort of remuneration will not make personal data a disposable way, a disposable asset in any way. Even for the consumer, if she or he would like to use the data in a way that is incompatible with the GDPR, that will have to be reflected in the contract. But such contracts, such contractual clauses will be in conflict with the GDPR, and then we go back to the first point, which is something that will, won't be uh, able to be enforced against the uh, consumers due to the mandatory nature of um, the rule. Therefore, from my point of view, there are sufficient safeguards to say that contractually, consumers will not be um, uh, will not be able to to um, or to go away. Businesses will not be able to avoid the GDPR uh, rules by imposing conditions on 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 the terms of uh, of service. And on the contrary, I see that the extension of um, consumer law to uh, to cover contracts in which this type of exchange is uh, taping, taking place, we add a new layer of protection that we currently do not have. The GDPR in, uh, imposes the conditions for the collection, the legal collection and processing of data, but does not concern the question of the fair exchange, you know, which is a matter of um, consumer law, maybe. And you mentioned the uh, unfair uh, contract terms uh, directive. So I do see a uh, potential, particularly in the um, digital content directive, uh, but we definitely need to fine tune the uh, scope of application to avoid conflicts, in particular with the uh, Article 7 uh, mm -hmm. 4 of the GDPR. Thank you. Thank you very much. No specific direct questions, so we move to the last speaker. Of today, it's uh, Sally Dupre, and we have we continue our overview of possible other interesting um, fields of law that we normally neglect as uh, the protection of experts. And we, uh, Sally, is half academic, half a real normal person dealing with <laughs> normal people as a practicing lawyer, and she's at the University of San Luis, and she knows a lot of about data protection law, but also a lot about intellectual property law, and I think she's going to bring a, a different perspective uh, to the discussion. Sally. Thank you so much. Thank you also for the organization of this wonderful, uh, wonderful event. 
Uh, to be honest, I was probably among the first to register for the event because <laughs> I wanted to attend really badly. Uh, and so the person in charge said, well, I'm sorry, the registration is not open yet. And then like two weeks after, uh, I had a call with uh, Romain saying, hey, would you want to be on this panel? It's really interesting. It's like, uh, OK. <laughs> so instead, I'm uh, thinking with you uh, on, on this uh, super important uh, topic. Um, now, as Gloria said, I'm going to think a bit on uh, from a different angle, um, i.e. From, from different uh, immaterial goods. We have personal data, but we have examples in different fields of law, such as copyright, IP in general, but copyright uh, very specifically. We have image rights also, and we have the non-personal data, um, which, which can be traded, of course, and which is being done uh, very frequently nowadays. Um, I think, uh, well, compl uh, complete, uh, from, or, or adding perhaps on your analysis from uh, a general contract uh, point of view, perhaps one notion that I, I think is mustn't be forgotten is indeed how can we uh, rely on general contract law, and this is something that is well, very difficult in the case of immaterial goods, is indeed, indeed the de determination of value, because as we know. Civil code provides uh, the general uh, freedom to contract. You're free to conclude a contract or not conclude a contract. And you're also free to determine the content of the contract. And so uh, as far as price is concerned, as far as counterparty is concerned, you're not really obliged to do anything. And so how to determine price is really up to, to the parties to, uh, to negotiate. Now, um, with regard to personal data, I would think that one of the problems that may be worth examining is um, the object of the contract, the subject matter of the contract. Because this, of course, is one of the conditions of validity of any contract is that there should be an object for the contract. There should be, should be a valid uh, subject matter, but it should be determined, or at least it should be possible to determine it. And this, in my view, may pose a problem as well if we are in well confronted with data we know some of the data that we share with uh, other people in, in an online context, but we don't know everything. We have the submitted data, but we also have the, the uh, observed data and the inferred data. And we have no idea as users, not only consumers, but as people active on, on the web, we have no idea really on what that is. So is this an object that is determined and is, is it possible on the basis of the contract alone to determine really the subject matter of these contracts? To me, this is not so not so sure. But of course, this is a, a subject matter that should be an, uh, analyzed in, in uh, further detail, uh, in my opinion. Now, as far as IP is concerned, um, I think there are so certain things that we can learn from copyright. Copyright is part of the intellectual property rights. It is recognized as a fundamental uh, right in the first uh, protocol to the European uh, Convention of Human Rights. It's recognized as well, of course, in the Charter of uh, the Fundamental Rights in, uh, in the EU. Um, we have a very long tradition in, in, uh, in, in copyright since the 19th century in, in, with international harmonization and since the 90s also with European uh, harmonization. And why is this an interesting thing? Well, apart from the traditions that already live in, in the member states, of course, why is this an interesting uh, exercise, in my opinion, is because we have these aspects, these double aspects. On the one side, we have the economic aspects clearly recognized it's, it's beyond doubt that you can conclude contracts on the economic rights in copyright. But there's also moral rights. And there we're closer, perhaps, to this protection of personality, these personality rights that we also find in image rights. And so um, as far as the economic rights are concerned, we, well, this is something that can be debated in all uh, openness. We have different forms of exploitation, uh, which are protected by different rights, different economic rights. So it's reproductions, there's a communications to the public that can cover, uh, for example, print uh, print forms, uh, certain uh, online uh, exploitations by streaming, by download, etc. So there, the qualification is not so difficult. Then under Belgian law, there's a number of moral rights that really protect different aspects of the personality of the author. Um, recognizing thus this very romantic idea of the relationship between an author and his or her work, copyright protected work. So it's supposed to be a very intimate uh, relationship. So touching on 
the work is supposed to touch upon or like hurt the, the author um, herself as well. So there's different rights of uh, moral, moral rights, right of authorship, right of integrity, <clears throat> right of first uh, publication. And so this integrity right, for example, is this possibility for uh, an author to prohibit or to, well, to prohibit any type of modification, any type of change that will affect the reputation of the uh, author. So we see the, the very close link between the author and uh, the personality rights. Now, what are the consequences for contracts? Because if this is truly the case, then it should not be possible to conclude contracts on these, uh, these, these moral aspects. Um, and this is true up to a certain point. So contract law, in Belgium at least, author is considered as the weaker party with the lower bargaining uh, power. So there is protection for the author with regard to, well, in the negotiations with uh, um, a commercial a commercial player, such as a publisher or a, a, a music label. As far as the economic rights are concerned, there's no limitations as such. You can negotiate whatever you want. You can you can have the, the your work commercialized for free, there is no obligation as to price, there is no uh, restriction as to price, you can negotiate what you want. And as far as moral rights are concerned, there's, it's, it's a bit more difficult, it's a bit more tricky. So um, it is not possible to sell your moral rights. It is not possible to transfer your moral rights. You can't assign or give a license of your moral rights. At most, you can say, I will refrain from exercising my moral rights if these conditions are met. And then the contract can uh, dig into or can, can detail um, the modalities of exercise of this moral right or mm -hmm. what the author will accept as far as, as the integrity is concerned. But you can't say in advance, you go ahead and do whatever you want with my work, I will never object to this. Especially if the honor or the reputation of the author is harmed by uh, one of those modifications, they can always go and object and they can always try to get damages. Now that's as far as the contracts are concerned. Then, of course, is we, we have the, the, the question of infringement. Because, well, in case of infringement, there's material damage that we can uh, evaluate with rather classical um, uh, means. But then there's moral damage. And how do um, judges, how do they uh, assess moral damage or uh, an inf infringement of, of uh, moral rights? They will normally take like the license price, for example. How much will they um, ask for the the well the normal license price? And maybe they will just double it, or they can uh, triple it, and that will be the valuation of the the damage of uh, for the infringement of moral rights. That's one uh, possibility. For those um, well smaller authors that don't really have this established. Um, practice of giving licenses to uh, s s standard um, values, for example. There's collecting societies that have developed this entire practice of asking their members how much do you ask more or less for this type of exploitation. And again, if there is some kind of infringement to one of the moral rights, they will use this type of tariffs to double it or to triple it. That's one approach. The other approach is an ex aequo et bono uh, appreciation and then we see in general judges are very very reluctant the the, the evaluation is very low it's like 500 euro at most perhaps a thousand euro um, so perhaps there's uh, things to to be learned from copyright up to a certain extent I think the parallel may may hold but of course there is um, a difference, well, one of the big differences I see between, between copyright and uh, data protection is, um, well, on the one hand, there's, for copyright, it's a bit more straightforward. There's more transparency. Because if your work is being used, is being published, is being distributed somewhere, you will see it. You, know. you, will, you will know. Yeah. And you will be able to push for actions. You will be able to, 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 to go forward. Um, for data protection, this is different because there may be all these internal processes, all these, these uh, uh, value creation uh, that is covered by perhaps also uh, confidentiality and, uh, and, and trade secrets. So you will 
probably not know what's going on and you will probably not know how, how, how much your damage is. And second um, point of difference, I think, is this collective dimension, because for copyright, it's a fairly individual or an individualistic point of view, a fairly individualistic approach to, to damage. It's just one author exploitation of a work for this one author. But for data protection, that may be different as well, because my data is only my data. It has very little value. If a company has only my data, it has very little value. But if they can put it up to uh, in, in the big data, big data bunch, then it has way more value. And um, systematically pushing the boundaries of what can be done and what, what is being done has an effect on the, our collective practices as well. How do we behave in the online world? In, in well, uh, What do we see? How do we, what do we read? How can we respond? Will we auto-censor? This is a collective damage that, uh, or a, com a collective dimension that is completely missing um, from copyright. I think that, that's enough. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think we have a uh, lot, many m new elements uh, now. Now, the, officially, the, the time for uh, open questions, uh, comments from the audience is, is open. So, if you have questions, please. You're very far away. I don't know. There's a security space here between them. <laughs> in case you want, I see you. So, if you have questions, please, please ask. In the meantime, Romain is probably keen to ask something. I can break the ice. Yes. I, I had a question about, I, I, I'm sure, um, I hope you, you read it uh, two weeks ago, um, the German court decided against Facebook, uh, against Facebook violating the terms and condition uh, directive, but also stating an interesting, um, an interesting idea about uh, the question whether Facebook was or not uh, in a position to uh, announced that Facebook was a free services uh, yeah. was a free service, and the court decided that there was nothing uh, deceptive um, yeah. um, in saying that you were providing a free service such as Facebook. Yeah. Uh, personally, I must say that I was a little bit disappointed, yeah. and, and I would like to know whether you had any yeah. reaction or any yeah. opinion on this because I think it's an interesting decision uh, linked to this question of is this service against data, a free service, or uh, do you think yeah. we should qualify it in another, yeah. another position? Can, can you go? Um, yeah, I saw and, and I also found it um, disappointing and also you don't kind know, of yeah. really didn't fit. But the reason uh, why I think the, the, the court reached that conclusion had to do uh, with the theological interpretation, basically, of the um, Unfair Commercial Practices Directive. Because there is um, a, a, a black practice, which is that you cannot advertise something for free when really it is not for free. But when this directive was, was drafted and was decided, the idea was always in relation to a price, to a monetary payment. You know? And that's why, since there is no such an exchange in the context of, of Facebook, then the court uh, arrive to the conclusion that the UCPD will not be, or this particular practice will not be uh, applicable, which put forward an interesting question for the upcoming review of the UCPD. As you know, there is also the, uh, the refit uh, exercise in which the Commission is also evaluating uh, other uh, consumer law uh, instruments, including the Unfair Commercial Practices and the Fair Contract uh, Terms Directive and the Consumer Rights Directive in which there is the, this question of to what extent these instruments should also be extended, like with the uh, digital content directive, to cover uh, situations in which consumers access service in exchange of something else but money. Geraldine? Yes, thank you. Um, yes, we, we read it. Uh, obviously, we, we had a, a slightly different perspective on, mm -hmm. on, on this. Um, we think that uh, it's um, uh, interesting to, to make the difference and to acknowledge that a service is free if um, it's, um, if it's um, in the case of Facebook where there is no monetary payment but there's an exchange of data. And so then we, we sort of fall back on our initial uh, discussion that we were having on, on uh, you know, the uh, transparency and um, explaining to the consumer the exchange value um, behind the data. Um, and uh, it's, uh, 
data is 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 a tr is a tricky concept because uh, at the beginning we started talking of money, saying you know data is a new currency. But then we realized that um, it's not really like a currency because, um, as we mentioned earlier, uh, a data subject always has rights on his or her data, um, uh, data subject rights which have been reinforced in the GDPR. And then, um, and then on the, uh, and then on, the, th there's also the notion uh, of um, data being um, a bit like a, a body part where this might be uh, another very strong view on, on, on what, uh, what data is, um, when um, the fact is that data is sort of in the middle where um, data it can be co commodified, data can be exchanged uh, for, for service. Um, so really we come back again to the question of, uh, of transparency and explaining to the consumer the, um, the benefits that the consumer is going to get from this exchange of value and being more uh, transparent um, and relying on uh, the GDPR and the Articles 13 and 14 there to, um, uh, to, to be clearer to, to, the, uh, to the data subject. But uh, still we think that um, a service uh, which doesn't require monetary payment could still be qualified as free so long as I, as I said all the other information is, is there and accurate to help the consumer make, uh, make his choice. But if, it's, if you say that there is a value in the data, then how can argue that it's for free? Well, there, there is a value in the, in the data. The, data the, the value that it, there is in the data is the value that the consumer will get from, from the service. So, for example, the, the consumer will get uh, discounts or vouchers or will be able to get uh, uh, a, um, participation to exclusive events or will be able to get a, a better service. Uh, ultimately, businesses use data for, for three things. They want to improve the service to the benefit of the consumer. They want to, um, they, they want to, uh, to uh, personalize uh, the service also to the benefit of, of the consumer. They want to promote better their services, that means reach out. And this is something which is really important for uh, companies to try to enter the market. And here we touch a bit about the question of competition. And uh, they want to innovate. And um, all this uh, comes back to, to the benefit of, uh, of the, the consumer. Um, afterwards, uh, as I said, d data isn't like a currency, so its, uh, um, it, it's value fluctuates um, with time, depending on the market and things like that. So the, the, the value that the consumer will get from the, uh, from the data is, is, are all these services or benefits um, that, uh, that he or she will perceive. Okay. Um, yeah, well, I suppose I'd just like to raise one or two points. Um, like, first, in relation to, um, I suppose it, it was no, I, in some ways I was surprised to see it, in other ways I was surprised, I, I wasn't surprised that it was a German court that decided this, uh, because I also think that it's interesting that, I mean, uh, I'm far from an expert in civil contract law, but uh, from what I understand, you don't need a consideration for the for a contract. So essentially, I think it shows the the um, disconnection between uh, consumer protection and data protection, generally speaking. And I think to further highlight this, we can also refer to the I'm not sure if you're aware of this, but the Italian Consumer Protection and, and Competition Authority uh, uh, rulings on uh, the. Uh, following the, fo uh, the fallout from the Facebook WhatsApp uh, merger, mm -hmm. uh, where, interestingly, Facebook tried to argue that uh, personal data couldn't be treated like an economic asset with reference to the, the opinion that came from the EDPS. Um, uh, but the court, or the Consumer Protection Authority, essentially threw that out. So I think that it just shows that this area is a little bit of a harmonization mess, essentially, that we have mm -hmm. uh, various <laughs> interpretations at a national level as to what forms a contract. Uh, and this is going to, like, this proposal, the digital content proposal, uh, in itself it will, pr will um, cause major problems for common law jurisdictions because we don't have that, uh, yeah, we, we don't have mm -hmm. contracts just without some form of consideration. So de facto, this will be a form of consideration. Data will be treated like, like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I just think that the whole issue is just showing that there is very little uh, knowledge about how these two areas align. Um, mm -hmm. 
And I, I think you can refer to a lot of th things uh, for this. I think the, the, the German courts have been quite active in this area as well in terms of looking at terms and conditions of use and looking at the unfair terms directive, but also the unfair commercial practices. But they've looked, and you can look at the, the, the consumer network issued the opinion on social media uh, networks as well, uh, and they referred a lot to jurisdiction clauses uh, and clauses about uh, you know selection of law, for instance, which are far more within the, the realm traditionally of uh, B2C uh, cross-border uh, protections. So I think uh, what it's all pointing towards is that really this area is very much in its infancy. Uh, and in my opinion, that this this proposal, this digital content proposal, is uh, kind of emblematic of that. It shows that it's symptomatic, mm -hmm. and, and essentially, it's, it's a rushed attempt to continue with maximum harmonisation approach in the consumer protection policy agenda. Um, so, that would be my opinion. Yes, please. Yes. Could you comment on two aspects uh, in the discussion? The first one is in some jurisdictions, like in the Netherlands. A contract can be void, null and void when it's in violation of public order. So when you give up fundamental rights, data protection of personal information is a fundamental right. If you uh, ask people to give that up, even if they do it voluntarily, it's a violation. It could be a violation of public order, and the contract will be null and void. Other aspect is that from the obligation of data minimization, wouldn't it be always uh, obligatory to provide an alternative which would require less data, like a monetary payment? So that in such cases you will have to provide an alternative which requires less data, because from the perspective of the data minimization, you will always have to have an option that there are less data processed, and then you can ask a monetary payment. I have to repeat the question for the video, I think. So the first one was, uh, is it possible, uh, sh should we uh, consider some contracts uh, null and void because they are in violation of the public order and then take into account personal data? And the second question is, should we provide uh, an alternative in the name of data minimization so you could just pay actually with, with money instead of paying with your data? Volunteers? Yes? I can go with the first one, perhaps. I think that that will be the case in most uh, jurisdictions. Uh, I don't know the specificities of the um, of the Dutch law, uh, but at least for the clauses that contravene a mandatory provision or somebody calling the, the law police or the public order will be voided. And that's what I said when I said that the um, the, the inclusion of um, data as a content performance remuneration, whatever term uh, we use, the first safeguard that you will have preventing that a company ask more data than what they should in violation of the GDPR is the fact that such clauses, even if the consumer agrees, will be uh, void because they contravene a mandatory provision of the public order. So I think that's the, the most important thing. If I may just to, to, to put some pressure on you, how does this make sense from a consumer perspective? Because it, it, it makes sense that in the end the contract will be null. But if you have still contracts that are saying to people, give us this data in exchange of your free or your service, mm. and then we have to rely on the fact that eventually they will discover that everything was a lie, that, that's not really making any progress in terms of information but and transparency. True. The, the progress for me is, is given by, by the fact, as I said, that you will have a new grounds you know, of protection at the end of the day. Um, whether the, the company is, is providing misleading information or incomplete information about how they process the data and they request more data, but that, that is, needed, is a problem that we nevertheless have within with the GDPR. You know, they can, under the GDPR, they can, they can they have to inform you, you know, for what the data is being uh, collected and, and, and processed, and then you can make you know, the test on whether it is proportional or not and, and whether the principle are comply. So I don't see a difference in relation to the uh, consumer protection uh, uh, le legislation. Um, so that's why it, it's true that the, we can put that the, 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 the trader you know, asks the consumer for data you know, to, provide, to provide the service. Well, they will have to do it you know, always in compliance with the GDPR principles. So it's, again, this ability to dispose of something that you own, which will be the case of the personal data. You can dispose it, but with certain limits, and those limits will be imposed by the law police, the public order, and, and, and so on. But I'm not so sure if this is really helpful, because the consumer, in the end, they want the service. So that's, it's, it's not, 
you can your your contract will be annulled and so nobody will owe anything to anyone but you want to have access to the service so where are you then yeah, but it's the same it's, thing. then it's a binary choice either yeah. maybe yeah, the, the second question was the GDPR. answer maybe I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I I think uh, uh, I think it's uh, it's an interesting question uh, regarding um, the possibility for um, um, this notion of public order and, and contracts being void. I think that uh, just uh, to put back in context, um, Article Six of the GDPR provides for a different legal basis for processing of data. Uh, one of them is necessity of the contract, uh, and the others are, cons uh, among all the others, there's also consent and legitimate interest, which shows that uh, it's uh, um, uh, traders, uh, businesses, are allowed to, to, to process uh, data. Um, I think that, uh, uh, it, and also, it's, uh, the consumer is free to, uh, to choose um, if uh, he or she wants to uh, trade data to receive um, uh, content or service or benefits, like some of the benefits that I mentioned earlier, for, for free. Um, this, is, this is the first thing. The second thing also to put in context is that um, the Consumer Rights Directive provides that uh, the formation of the contract uh, is to be decided at national level. This is the competence of member states. Um, and, uh, and so uh, uh, I think that we here, uh, it's becoming, we're getting into a, such a tricky situation because we're trying to interpret the GDPR and we have, as we can see today, very different uh, complementary, a, a lot of enriching views on how to interpret the GDPR. And, 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 this, and next to that, we want to uh, add, to, uh, reinforce it, its effects or add to it, or in, uh, as we see things, create overlap and potential contradictions with uh, c consumer law. And so this, the, two, so two questions come to mind. Firstly, is this helpful uh, for, for the consumer, as, as uh, Sari, Sari raised? Um, uh, and is this uh, useful also for the traders who currently are, are doing their best to implement the, the GDPR? And coming to your question of uh, should, it, should there be an obligation to have paid alternatives, um, I would say that uh, this uh, should not be required in the law, but uh, it's a matter of market di di diversity and diversification and that um, uh, the, the the consumer should uh, should be free to uh, um, to to these um, uh, free contracts if he or she wishes uh, wishes so, and um, you do have some uh, some uh, businesses where uh, diversification is is um, is uh, more visible. Uh, if you take, for example, the the publisher publishing sector uh, or the press, there is some press which is entirely for free. There is some press which is uh, which has a mixed regime of uh, paid and not paid. Um, and uh, and you have uh, and you have some press which is uh, uh, which is paid for, but uh, still then uh, not the entire price is reflected. Uh, not the entire price of the service is, is generally reflected on the c on the consumer. Um, so uh, yes, just a few contexts. Thank you, Damian, and then I will stick. Yeah, um, I suppose I just I, I'd more like to address the second question, so the data minimization one. And I do think that the the second actually addresses the first. Um, so uh, and also like purpose limitation, yeah. So I think the two of those combined kind of answers the public order question uh, within the context of the GDPR and whether things are balanced both ex ante and ex post uh, in a fair way in line with the fairness principle. Um, but I suppose just in terms of. Uh, you know, alternatively requiring a monetary payment, I think that that's a dangerous path to take, actually, because, I mean, this panel, this discussion is about putting a price on personal data, and I think that that would be the ultimate version of that. I mean, because essentially then, are you going to be seg segregating portions of society that simply can't afford to have personal data protection? Um, so I think that there's an interesting uh, discussion there. There's also, I mean, there is even a discussion, if we look at uh, the Article 7.4 of the GDPR, whether it kind of requires this in a way that, um, but through the separation of consent and contract. So, you, you know, you only gather the minimum amount of data to achieve the provision of the service in line with the contract grounds, so 6.1b. 
uh, and then essentially everything on top of that uh, requires consent. Uh, but I think the alternative, like you know, monetary payment, uh, it wouldn't be something that I would personally advocate. Yeah, I have just um, two short points. First, I don't really think that it's an issue of a contract formation, but of a scope. The EU, the Commission, but we have been trying to harmonize contract formation already for a while. We had the first attempt with the uh, e-commerce uh, directive. Then it was mentioned the Common European States Law as well. But there is a lot of resistance for the member states. There are issues of proportionality and subsidiarity and so on, so it's not possible. But here it's really a matter of scope, you know, irrespective of when the contract is uh, concluded or when it is considered to be concluded, it's about what it is in the contract, what should be in the contract and which type of contract should fall under the consumer law key. We have the situation, for example, of um, sales contracts, you know, mm -hmm. we have been harmonizing many sales contracts on service contract for a while and now there is to extend it to contracts in which there is another type of remuneration consideration and we can use many uh, many, many terms so for me the, the core issue here is scope rather than um, formation and then uh, I would like to address the issue of whether this is helpful to the consumer and I would say this is extremely helpful for the consumer because it adds and brings rights that the GDPR is not giving to you for example conformity rights you know if the service that you're accessing in exchange of your data upon the collection of your data and so on you know is um, is um, defective or that's not the, the trade is not performing as was um, uh, promised in the contract, then you will have rights that today you need to look into the each national civil law or common law uh, regimes while you will have it harmonized at EU level for all consumers uh, and in a way that cannot be put aside by contract which is a fundamental um, element of uh, consumer protection. Then if that's in the case of the digital content directive, but if we think even about extending uh, the scope uh, to the unfair commercial practices directive, then we have the situation of Facebook, you know, which is a protection against unfair practices that today you don't have. And a, and a, and a court have decided that the advertising as free of uh, Facebook is not an unfair commercial practice, which um, many of us um, do not uh, agree. And finally, uh, compensation rights in relation to a, a contractual um, liability, which is something that you do not have necessarily in relation to these type of contracts. Thank you. Sally, do you want to say something? Uh, what I may want to add is perhaps that, uh, from my point of view, it will be more useful to have an obligation to correct the service rather than to you know, the, the contract. Oh, yeah. You have yeah. that, you have yeah, that yeah. in the digital so contract. Right? Yeah. In that sense, I think that... I mean, in, in the broad sense, just, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just annulling the, the, the contract may not be so, so useful. And again, as yeah. far as the damages are concerned, but again, from, an, indivi from a, an individual point of view, how much will that be Absolutely, an incentive? Yeah. I mean, if it's yeah. just to be like have one uh, symbolic euro yeah. awarded, yeah. it's probably not very much of an incentive to actually yeah. go and do something about it. Yeah. But if you can have uh, larger rights, or you can you can pull all the rights yeah. and have all these these type of collective actions, that may be yeah. a bit more useful. Yeah. Um, keeping in mind, of course, that in the European context, we don't have punitive damages. We only have damages yeah. just uh, or a compensation covering the damage yeah. no yeah. more no less absolutely. so that's i think that's more practical uh, difficulties yeah, for me it relates to, to one of the questions I'm, I'm not sure what the state of this discussion now but i think in one of the the proposal of the commission there was this idea that so you give your data in exchange of a service then you realize that the service is not good because they don't comply with data protection law and and then as a solution they will give you back your data mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. with the promise mm -hmm. they will never use the, yeah. the copies mm -hmm. that they are storing and you will be happy uh, forever. Mm -hmm. I, I, I don't really see the, um, the logic of, of this. It's a, yes, the use it. it. Basically, it's a very primitive construction because basically it's a barter agreement. You exchange something for something else, not with mm -hmm. money. And barter agreements you generally see only in, in, in times of war, like after the collapse of the Soviet Union, for example, mm -hmm. there was no money, so people started to pay <coughs> an hotel room with bottles of water, for example. Now we have the concept of paying data for a service, but basically it's not a concept of a developed economy where you have money to pay for goods and services. <coughs> so now we get, because of development of technology, we get this concept, 
But in the end, as you never, for example, can pay a service, it would not be allowed with providing, for example, the availability of your body. It's a question, can you uh, say, I will sacrifice my fundamental rights, who are protected in the Charter uh, and, and uh, the European Convention, I will uh, give up my rights or violate my rights or limit my rights for this service. I think this is a question we could end up that it's not at all possible anymore that you can pay with money and not anymore uh, with supplying data because of the protection of those rights and because they will be considered in, in violation of the Now, no, Romain is going to repeat your question. Yeah. So, so basically, you were basically you were just asking whether uh, you could end up in a situation where you could not be in a position to pay with your data because they are protecting as a fundamental right, which I think also may be a matter of discussion, and only being able to pay for the service with money, which is uh, kind of the characteristic of a viable economy, uh, basically. Can I react quickly to? Um, your remark on the termination right. Mm. I agree that for uh, personal data it's not so relevant because that is covered by the uh, GDPR mm. at the end of the day. You just withdraw your consent and mm. voila. But what you say is quite important, which is the, the fact that the, the supplier and you know, then should be obliged to rectify the, mm. the, the, the contract, the service uh, itself. Mm. And this is something that it is foreseen in the um, digital content directive mm. as um, um, it's not a repair right, uh, it's, it's a kind of a, a, a right to cure, something like that. Um, so what I, what I saw the real added value of this termination right, the possibility to get your data back is in relation to non-personal data. Then we have the whole question of what is non-personal data eventually, you know, any data could be, uh, would be able to identify a physical person, therefore would fall in the scope of the of the GDPR. But again, you might have situations in which there is data that cannot be qualified as personal data or will fall outside the scope of the GDPR and would have been very useful to have this termination right with such consequences for those situations. But unfortunately, both the, the Council and the, and the EP have uh, excluded such possibility. I know, sorry, the, e the EP have maintained it under um, user-generated content, which is not personal data. Unfortunately, it's not defined what is user-generated content, but it is, uh, it is included. Um, I'm, actually, I'm glad someone raised the charter, because as the academic in the panel, it gives me a chance to talk about it. <laughs> but uh, I, I think you're right, uh, and it's, it's an interesting point. I think really what's important here is the Article 52.1, so the, essentially the respect for the essence of the right, the limitation of rights, so the proportionality and necessity principles. Um, and I suppose we've discussed a lot here, the GDPR, um, uh, in comparison with the Digital Content Directive, but what we should really be doing, in my opinion, is looking at uh, Article 8 uh, and 8.2 and 52.1 uh, in particular, uh, because essentially Article 52.1 is, um, it, provi it allows for the limitations of, of a right if it's uh, provided by law. Uh, and the GDPR and the digital content proposal, if it becomes law, are essentially then on equal footing because they're essentially limiting rights uh, the same way. Mm -hmm. So it's, I think what the GDPR becomes then is a litmus test for compliance rather than the, the assessment of compliance. And if we were to look at that, we, can, we have examples of how other pieces of secondary law were found in violation with the digital, con digital retention or the data retention directive, for instance. Um, so I think that that's an, a, it's an interesting point, and I think uh, just to link it back a little bit as well, uh, the GDPR complies with the Charter because it has ex ante and ex post fair balancing mechanisms. It has, uh, you know, rights such as uh, in, in in ex ante sense Article six one, for instance. Uh, so the information provision in consent or has fair balancing and legitimate interest, and in an ex post sense it has rights to erasure. Uh, and right to access. And I think where this uh, proposal may fall down is especially in the ex post sense. Mm. So how does it respect the right to erasure in particular? Uh, yeah. uh, and, you know, because that correlates re very much with the right to withdraw consent as, you know, uh, which can be extrapolated from Article A2 in the Charter. Uh, so I, that would be, I suppose, my addition. It's not really a and in any way an answer to your, uh, if it was a question, but it's just another comment on top, I think. You're taking a strong position, saying that the, the whole directive is a limitation of, of the right to data protection, which for me is not the purpose, no. it could not be the purpose of this directive. 
Well, I mean, it's, it's still. Um, I mean, you could. You, I mean, you have to say that it limit it, it limits it in a certain sense because it is recognizing its uh, personal data as a counter performance. Um, so I mean, it's recognizing the ability to give it away for the for a service. So, so you see a fundamental contradiction between between both. Oh, sorry. Uh, there, there may be unless it respects the uh, like ex post protections okay. like the GDPR does. So I mean, I think that, that could be a very difficult issue in the drafting. So it's not only like the more ex ante stuff, the whether personal data is consideration. It's how you, uh, you know, how it respects uh, rights like the right to erasure that are evident in uh, their micro rights, but their manifestations of Article A two. I would say. Yes. I think that uh, here it's um, um, well for, for on the digital content directive. The, the it was in, important in our view to align uh, certain parts of the digital content directive on the GDPR precisely to to avoid a contradiction between what the GDPR provides and what the D D digital content directive could provide. So, in this sense, uh, we were we were happy to see that. Um, um, in terms of uh, what happens uh, once the contract is terminated, there was a simple reference. Now there's a simple reference to the GDPR, which makes, uh, which means that there's alignment with the GDPR, which makes the legislation simpler and clearer in in our view. Um, and I think that this is also to the benefit of the of the of the consumer ultimately. Um, for for this. Um, 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 for, for the, this digital content directive, uh, ra raise the question of uh, of um, counter performance. But as we've said, it doesn't forbid counter performance. It it just um, uh, it's the more the term of counter for counter performance, which is not to be used. But it's uh, 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 data as an exchange uh, or d exchanging data is still a, a possibility and something that that uh, consumers uh, can do. And so the, it comes back to the question of uh, the more general question of uh, uh, fairness uh, for for the um, for the consumer, and this um, this question of, of fairness you is is in the GDPR, and uh, I would refer to this uh, big uh, study that the ICO did, which uh, I think it won a prize of uh, best best paper uh, uh, two years ago. It was, it's called Big Data, Artificial Intelligence, Machine Learning and Data Protection by the ICO. And um, this is the topic that they talk about, saying, well, how do we balance, uh, you know, um, uh, pr collecting and processing of data where we don't want traders to hoover up uh, everything and all the data, so keep a certain um, proportionality and respect uh, um, the principle of data minimization. And at the same time, we want innovation, and they, they, um, in their view, they say, well, fairness goes through three things: uh, transparency, um, looking at the effects of data, and uh, preventing discrimination, and taking into account reasonable expectations. And so, th these uh, so so these aspects of fairness are already in the GDPR, and are aspects that uh, that uh, controllers will have in mind in in the future. Um, for example, when when assessing if, if there is a legitimate interest uh, for the process for the processing of data, um, reasonable expectations is one of the criteria that the um, um, the controller has to take into account. Thank you. We have a question. Yes. Thank you. A question about the so the idea of value, putting value in the data, and who is responsible for articulating that value? And we've mentioned a couple of times in Thank you. 
about it, it, it shifts over to organizations, mm -hmm. organizations being accountable for explaining exactly what they do and what the benefit is, even all the details on the back end. Yes. So basically, I'll try to summarize. You, you, you want to say that there are two values for the data. The one, on the one side, you have the value that you can get from uh, the data you do exchange or the, the voucher, whatever value that you get from the enterprise, from the company. And there's, there's, on the other hand, the hidden value, which is the value that the company can make with the data that the company is processing and you're questioning whether this value should not be disclosed or who should be assessing this value made by the company to make this exchange fair. Is it kind of a question? Yes. Thank you. <laughs> yes, Agustin? I, I, I can give it a try. It's a tricky question, but it's a very good one. Um, so companies are, are ready putting a, a, a price tag on data. For example, there have been companies in, in the US that even will issue a check for giving you unconditional access you know, to your uh, Facebook account. Uh, I think of something around $17 or something like that. Um, so of course, it could be a business model even behind that. But I think that when it comes to what is the real value of the data, we're we going to start seeing um, such developments in the case law. And that will be done on a case-by-case -case basis and mainly on cases that relate to damages and, and, and compensation because the value of the data will depend on the particular situations of the individual, the type of data that we are, that we are talking about and the circumstances surrounding the case. So it will be extremely difficult to set in abstracto what will be the parameters for, for that, uh, such data and for the value of such data, but we could expect perhaps and hopefully an evolution in the case law that will lead us to uh, set certain parameters that on a case-by-case -case basis we'll be able to define at the end of the day how much your data is worth in a case of a data breach, for example, you know, or, or any other type of uh, privacy uh, violation. We, uh, before the, during the, um, the lunch we were discussing, we had a similar debate, for example, uh, when um, courts started measuring, you know, the value of the life or how much you should be compensated when somebody, you know, a relative uh, passed away, you know, who can put a price tag on somebody's life. Um, and nevertheless, there had been uh, an evolution in the jurisprudence with the aim of establishing certain parameters that will enable, for example, a court mm -hmm. Uh, in, in, in this type of, of, of cases to estimate the value of or a compensation for the distress that a person has suffered because of the loss of somebody. You know. Nothing excludes that in the future we could see such an evolution in the case of uh, data protection you know, infringements. I think I am only moderating, but I will try to also answer because I think it's, it's, it's very interesting. We have many ways that which we can look at this. One is the question of the, the value when we exchange the data, and then the, the value indeed when we, there's a problem. And that's what Sarah's point, and I think it's very relevant, mm -hmm. because this idea of what is the value when we exchange the data, it's, it's, very, it's very difficult, I think, uh, from a logical perspective. If you remember, we are trying to address this problem of the free services, the idea that people think Facebook is for free, and we want to tell them mm -hmm. Facebook is not for free. So we want to tell them the, the data has a value, but in the end, what we end up is falling into the, the trap of believing that Facebook has a value because we are being told we are given something that is valuable in exchange of something, therefore Google has a value, therefore Facebook has a value. And, and we have, then we are surprised by the fact that this stuff that we didn't ask for is free. Well, it is for free. It is, it is, it is a bit complex. I don't know if there are any mat mathematicians in the, in the room, <laughs> expert mathematicians, but if you, if you try to figure out this, this equation, so you have something that we don't know the value of this, it's an x, 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 so x, equals something y, we know y, y is the, the free service that we receive, and this equals zero, because it's free. So what is the value of x? If x equals y and y equals zero, the value <laughs> is, is, is zero. And so this data actually, in practice, the value is zero, we give it away for free, we receive nothing in exchange except, yes, uh, marketing and, and things. So it, 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 the, when we look at this from this perspective, I think it's impossible to objectively know what's the, the uh. value that we would agree. So in the end, from a legal perspective, we have this other, mm -hmm. let's go to the court and say, well, you misbehaved, you took the data, you shouldn't take it, and, and now the court will say, what was the value? Mm -hmm. 
I think that, yes, sorry. Excuse me, I just, a little I'd bit like, of provocation. I, I'd to like to, 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 to add to, to, to that. Um, I heard uh, you, you don't get anything in exchange, you get marketing. Well, um, when you go and check your, your newspaper every morning and that you're not paying for this, um, you're actually getting all the content of your press. Um, this is this is much more than marketing. When you get uh, uh, w when you uh, um, uh, par are part, for example, of a loyalty program, you do benefit from marketing. You get discounts, you get vouchers, you get you know um, uh, uh, participation to, to to events. You get a lot of market uh, opportunities which have value and which are appreciated by a lot of people. Um, so I think that we, we, we should respect the free choice of uh, data subjects to, um, uh, to, to, to um, uh, use their data, share their data as, as their wish. Um, uh, however, it's, it, it is true that um, um, uh, this is also in, 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 the, in the study that I mentioned at the beginning that um, it still is a challenge for the industry to continue to uh, explain better the, the benefits uh, of the exchange value to the consumer and still 78% of consumers consider that, that this is the case, that they, they still consider that uh, they perceive that the industry um, benefits uh, disproportionately from the data economy. So the, 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 the industry um, does have to um, demonstrate more and communicate more the value exchange to, to, the, to the consumer because uh, really the consumer uh, benefits a lot from, uh, from this economy. And um, we, we mentioned uh, the e-privacy, the e we were talking about the value of data. Well, um, it, it's... Um, if you look at uh, advertising based on behavioral uh, data, there are uh, five, it, it generates five times uh, more clicks, a higher click rate than normal. And it's 10 times a higher click rate in case of retargeting. That's an IHS uh, market study. Um, and publishers uh, ha has uh, more revenues um, uh, sorry, ad, ad space costs higher because of there's better knowledge of the audience and that gives uh, more revenues uh, to the publishers. Um, so these, th this shows that um, uh, data does have a value for companies and that uh, if you look at the weak uh, st study that was uh, ordered by the German government, it shows that the digital advertising budget would reduce of one third um, uh, if, if the e privacy goes through with only a consent basis, which comes back to the initial point that we do, yes, the industry might have to work better on uh, explaining the uh, value exchange to the consumer, but we also need to keep this balance in the legislation, the risk based approach that we currently have in the GDPR, and keep this balance between uh, the different legal bases, notably consent and legitimate interest. Thank you. We, yes. Last question. Thank you. It's not really a question. It's a very yeah. interesting discussion. I think uh, from hearing the panel, I have a question. Uh, obviously, we define value differently in the context of personal data, as far as I can hear. And also, to me, personal data is priceless, but it's, it has values. Right? So the question is, how can we formulate something that has value, but is priceless? Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. uh, Obviously, as you highlighted, Facebook, you know, and it's priceless. 
It's a, it's a pity that you don't have the microphone because now <laughs> Romain has to repeat everything. <laughs> May I add one, one yes. point to it, please? Um, of course, data will have a value because companies with a lot of personal information, they have a certain value, like Facebook, Google, they have a lot of personal data value. So already from that perspective, you can determine the value of personal data, but maybe they are in large quantities, but in some way you can assess the value. The value. You have data brokers of personal information. Mm -hmm. Also, then you have a market value. In the end, if you see the changes in the economy and the relevance of data, then it might make sense that you amend or uh, develop the accounting standards, international accounting standards, that companies are obliged to, put, to classify all the data sets they have and to give them a, a value in their financial statements. So that might be the way that you can put the price on things which is reflected in the balance sheet. Because if it's the oil of the economy, oil also has a value in the balance sheet as well. The same you can do with it. If you have large amounts of business information, all personal and personal information, you can oblige them to qualify them and, and uh, the value and put it in the balance sheet. Thank you. We have to conclude. So, Roman, we summarize the questions and then you will have the possibility short, to say your last word. Shortly, word. there was the, the 1 million euro question, I guess, um, because that's the price of this question, that's for sure. Uh, how can you put a price on something which is priceless as data? First question. And one of the elements of answer that I heard, but I think it's not, super, um, um, it's not satisfactory to, to the panelists uh, as far as I heard, is the, um, the market value of the, the, this company is treating the value, uh, the data. And I saw your faces, that's what I, I'm saying, that it's maybe not the complete answer that you might um, expect to answer the first question. What's the price of this uh, data? Can you just go and look on the market value of this company, or should we look some, somewhere else to, to find an answer? You have uh, 30 seconds. Thank you. Yes. I, go. Um, well, I suppose it, it, the whole thing is that it is priceless, so I, I wouldn't be necessarily in favor of putting a value on it. Now, there are plenty of studies that do, um, but I think that that's the economic, as you said, it's, it's more of like a treating it as an asset, but that's very much from a business perspective. Um, rather than the value to the person itself, uh, person themselves. So I, I would be hesitant um, to just um, approach this from a purely economic perspective um, and treat it like that. Uh, I think that would be my 30 seconds. Thank you. Geraldine? Um, uh, I would say that uh, it's uh, for the consumer to uh, uh, um, value the, the exchange and uh, make a choice uh, on, the, on that basis. And um, uh, GDPR, I'd like to remind you just one important principle on GDPR, it's the accountability of the controller, very important uh, principle. And um, finally, uh, FEDMA, we're updating our code of conduct to uh, align it on uh, the, the GDPR. And uh, we look forward to, to continuing this work and continuing these types of discussions. Thank you. Um, I'm going to steal your parallelism. Uh, with copyright, which I found it uh, very good and can definitely inform this debate. Your personality right to the protection of your data, of course, is priceless, but your data, you know, if framed in proprietary terms, can have a price tag. Mm -hmm. And I think that this distinction that uh, you made between the moral rights and the economic rights can shape this discussion. I, d I don't see much difference then between the moral rights to your reputation, you know, uh, with the protection of your integrity um, through the protection of your personal, your personal data. So, so indeed, the data in itself can have a price. Of course, it's very challenging to define what the price will be and how to translate it into the uh, balance sheet. And, and when you ask that question, the first thing I thought is when Facebook bought um, WhatsApp. Yeah. That was purely not because of the infrastructure necessarily of WhatsApp, but because of the customer base. Mm -hmm. And they have assessed the value. They and they assess the value. Mm -hmm. Exactly. Yeah. How much this customer base and this data cost? And this mm -hmm. is in the, in the <laughs> probably in the, in the balance sheet of, uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> of Facebook uh, and our reports. Yeah. I'd like to make a, a parallel again with, uh, with, with copyright. Um, what we know from IP litigation is that the value for the acquiring company is not the same as the value for the IP holder. So it's not because, well, there, my, my work has been counterfeit and, and uh, 
the, the person is making this, this type of profit, then I'm entitled to the entire profit. No. I'm just entitled to the part that I have lost. So that it, there's not a one-on-one -on -one relationship between no, the value no, no, of, of a company and the number of users, for of example. Course, 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 so course. that makes uh, the whole matter a bit more complicated. And yeah. secondly, what I um, think, well, I think for some um, services, it's probably possible to put a, a price tag on, uh, on on your personal data. Like the very simple example of, okay, I share this type of information and I get a voucher for so much. Okay, probably there's some kind of uh, calculation to be made. But if you drag into the whole reflection other fundamental rights, this becomes more complicated. So all the invisible uses, all the effects it may have, for example, on freedom of expression, freedom of to, to receive information, to impart information, this becomes a way more complicated uh, exercise, I think. And then it becomes impossible to say, OK, um, you know what, I am... Um, I will not receive this type of information ever again in return for this kind of money. It's impossible to make such such a such a such an exercise, I think. Thank you very much. I think we have to, to conclude here. Uh, I think we discovered we realized that the subject was even more difficult than we thought. So yes. we probably need uh, <laughs> ten more events like this. But thank you very much for being here. Thank, thank you, you, Roman, for welcoming us. You want to just You're welcome. No, um, it was an interesting debate. Maybe we should organize another one, huh, Gloria. Good <laughs> just good. to Looking be discussed. Forward. Thank you for coming. Um, I, I guess there is still coffee for um, yes. prolonging the discussion. So we still have a uh, half an hour to further debate on the on the, on the subject. I think it might be interesting. Thank and you. see you very soon, I think. Yes, thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you.